Hey students, Professor Nugent here. With this video, we start chapter 6, Linear Regression with Multiple Regressors. In chapter 6, we will discuss omitted variable bias using regression to estimate causal effects, multiple regression and OLS, measures of fit, sampling distribution of the OLS estimator with multiple regressors, and we will conclude chapter 6 with a discussion of control variables. In this video, we will focus on omitted variable bias. We're going to stick with our example of the relationship between the student-to-teacher ratio and test scores to discuss what we mean by omitted variable bias. In the class size example, beta 1 is the causal effect on test scores of a change in the student-to-teacher ratio by one student per teacher. When beta 1 is a causal effect, the first least squares assumption for causal inference must hold. That is, the expected value of u given x is 0. So, this is telling us that there are no factors in u that are related to x, or we cannot use u uh, to predict x. Okay. Uh, the error u arises because of factors or variables that influence y but are not included in the regression function. And there are always going to be omitted variables. We are always going to see a regression residual uh, simply because of the nature of random variability uh, in nature. However, if the omission of those variables results in not satisfying the least first scores assumption so that the expected value of u given x is not equal to zero, then we are going to have an OLS estimator that is biased. And that is what we call limited variable bias. The bias in the OLS estimator that occurs as a result of an omitted factor or variable is, a, is called omitted variable bias. For omitted variable bias to occur, this omitted variable, which we can call z, must satisfy two conditions. And these two conditions are as follows. First, z is a determinant of y. Okay, uh, So z is a part of u, so we're saying that there is some factor in u. That is the first omitted variable. This omitted factor must be important for the outcome variable. So we're thinking about some omitted factor that must be important for test scores. Next, the other condition that must be satisfied in order for us to see omitted variable bias is that this omitted factor z must be correlated with the regressor x. So not only is the omitted factor important for test scores, but the omitted factor is correlated with the student-to-teacher ratio. If both these conditions hold, then the omission of z results in omitted variable bias. So in our test score example, English language ability, whether the student has English as a second language plausibly as affects standardized test scores. For those who are native English speakers, think about how well you take an exam in some other language. For those who are not native, speak native English speakers, you may identify with this, that it can be more challenging to complete an exam well in a language that is not your native language. So this factor plausibly affects standardized test scores. So we're going to look at this omitted factor, call this omitted factor z, as a determinant of y, right? Where y is the test score. English language ability is z, the omitted factor. Okay, so let's underline this. We're thinking about English language ability. And that's our omitted variables, which affects test scores y. Now, so that tells us that English language ability satisfies the first condition. 
Right, that's the first condition. This omitted factor z is important for the outcome variable. Now let's think about whether this omitted factor is correlated with the regressor. Immigrant communities tend to be less affluent and thus have smaller school budgets and higher student-to-teacher ratios. Therefore, Z is correlated with X. And so, our second condition, this is the second condition, this one holds too. So by not specifying English language ability in our regression, we are going to impose omitted variable bias on our estimate of the coefficient on the student-to-teacher ratio, which is our beta 1 hat. Okay. Now, we can ask, what is the direction of this bias? Let's think about what common sense suggests. Where there are lower student-to-teacher ratios, you may also find more native English speakers. And where there are higher student-to-teacher ratios, you are likely to find less native English speakers. And so by not specifying English language ability, the magnitude of beta 1 is going to be uh, biased upwards because you are capturing something else in decreasing student-to-teacher ratio, that is, you're also capturing more native English speakers. And so you have two different things going on in the same variable that are increasing test score, right? You have both student-to-teacher ratio and a lower student-teacher ratio and more native English speakers all sort of being captured by the student-to-teacher ratio if you don't specify ling English language ability. And so you're going to see a higher magnitude for data one hat if you don't specify English language ability. So if we don't have any sort of common sense idea about what the direction of this bias can be, there is a formula that can help us think about this. So recall the equation that beta 1 hat minus beta 1 is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi minus x bar times ui over the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi minus x bar squared. And that is uh, simplified to this equation, which is 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of v i over n minus 1 over n of the sample variance of x, where v i is this variable that we specified, x i minus x bar times u i, which is approximately x i minus mu x times u i, where in large samples, the sample mean is approximately the population mean. Under our least squares assumption, uh, number one, we have that the covariance uh, between xi and, mu, and mu i is zero, right? And so that the numerator in this term goes to zero if we have satisfied least squares assumption number one. But what if we do not satisfy least squares assumption number one? That is to say, what if the expected value of xi minus mu x times ui, which is the covariance of xi and ui, is not equal to zero. Let's see what happens. Letting beta 1 be the causal effect and still satisfying least squares assumptions 2 and 3, but assuming that number 1 does not hold, we have in the numerator that this term converges in probability 
to the covariance between x and u, okay, over the variance of x. We can multiply and divide by the standard deviation of u. See, that's what we've done here. We have the standard deviation of x and the standard devi deviation of x in the denominator, which came from our denominator here. Multiply and divide by the standard deviation of u. And what we get is a very nice expression for the bias, right? The bias is the difference between our estimated coefficient and a population coefficient. And this difference is the ratio of the standard deviation of u to the standard deviation of x times the correlation coefficient between x and u. Now, if assumption number one is correct, then the correlation between x and u is zero. But if not, if we do not satisfy least squares assumption number one, then we have the following. Our estimated coefficient, our OLS estimate of beta one hat, will converge in probability to the true population coefficient plus this bias term which is the ratio of the standard deviation of u to the standard deviation of x times their correlation. Given that this omitted variable z is both a determinant of y, so that it is contained in u, and it is correlated with x, so that this correlation is, uh, this correlation is not equal to 0. Now the direction of the bias depends, it will depend on whether this correlation is positive or negative. Um, now, for example, our districts with few ESL students, they're going to do better on standardized tests, right, and have smaller classes, bigger budgets, so ignoring the effect of many ESL students, this would result in overstating the class size effect, right, this overstates the class size effect, because we're capturing more in the student-to-teacher ratio than the pure student-to-teacher ratio variation. There's other variation being captured by that, um, and so that coefficient is being biased. So we need to specify that other variation. Let's look at this in terms of data. If we look at the difference between low student-to-teacher ratio and high student-to-teacher ratio test scores, across all districts, we have that uh, the average difference is 7.4 points on the test. And this is the average across all districts for all levels of English language learners. Then we can break it out by the percent the percentage of English learners. So in row in these rows, one, two, three, four, we have broken out a difference in test scores by the percentage of English language learners. So the first row has the percentage of English learners less than 1.9%, then we go 1.9 to 8.8%, 8.8 to 23%, and finally the percentage of English learners in the district which is greater than 23%. And you can see that the difference in test scores is much smaller than the overall average. So, in effect, when we control for the percentage of English learners by putting them into groups where you're comparing a district that has a low student-to-teacher ratio to a district that has a high student to teacher ratio, but they have approximately the same percentage of English learners, you see a smaller difference in test score. So we're not capturing, we're not biasing that difference by the confounding factor, which is percentage of English learners when we control for that in our analysis.